Okay. Good afternoon all. Um, thanks for joining on the second webinar today. Um, we're just going to wait for a few minutes for people to log on. So I know there are many people joining us today and just want to make sure we've We've allowed time for them to log in. Right, so let's make a start. So once again, welcome everybody for joining the webinar today with Linda Greenwald. Um, I am absolutely delighted that Linda could actually um, join the webinar today and a little bit of background about Linda. Um, she's an international lecturer and an authority on tooth whitening. She released her book on um, bleaching techniques in restorative dentistry in 2001, which I have a copy of. Um, I remember I, I went into my cosmetic journey probably in about 98, 99. So that was one of the books that I was eager to, to, to get and read. So I read it cover to cover, Linda. Um, and I know you've written other books as well with um, Kathy Jemison as well, which I've read as well. So it's not the second, you know, I've, I've read a couple of your books. Um, she, Linda is the editor-in-chief of the journal Aesthetic Dentistry Today. Um, she, there is another, a later book that came out, Strategies, um, uh, Success Strategies for the Aesthetic Dental Practice um, by Quintessence. That's the one with, I think, Kathy, I believe. Um, and Linda's launched and currently chairs the British Dental Bleaching Society. So I'm absolutely delighted to have Linda doing the webinar today. And if you do have questions, please do use the chat function. Um, I'll ask um, Linda the questions at the end of the session. So over to you, Linda. Great. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. One small point, I'm not currently the chairman of um, the British Dental Bleaching Society. That is Zaki Kanan. Just right, so okay. that you know. Yes. Um, we started it in 2008 to lobby for change for the UK, and we've made a lot of change. I'll just talk a little bit about um, some more of the change that we're going to make. But I'd like to talk today about tooth whitening and managing teeth sensitivity, especially during the COVID era. I'm happy to, if you want to, um, type in some questions on the chat, and also if you you can message me directly on um, my Instagram, which is Greenwell Dental. If you look on the website here, that you can download any of the articles that we have published. We've published quite a few recently, and you just go to resources and you can download those articles. Um, these are some of the textbooks that I've written. This is the new one, um, which was in uh, with success strategies. And um, we're talking a lot about that because, because of the crises that we're in at the moment and um, building resilience. This book is specifically for building resilience and helping us move forward. Um, this is our new textbook from 2017, and I will be highlighting some of the uh, techniques inside. I want to focus today on what we can do in the COVID era, because although at the moment our practices are closed and we're doing triaging, we still can do tooth whitening. Um, so first of all, let's just talk about what's happening at the moment. First of all, um, we, uh, we are in the global pandemic at the moment. The UK is heavily affected. I think that um, the deaths are nearly 27,000, which is huge. And um, it has a major impact on dentistry. Going forward, it will have a major impact on how we're going to deliver dentistry as well. But in the meantime, while we're triaging, we can talk about how we can deliver safe tooth whitening for our patients because we should be able to do that. Um, we do know that um, the virus is secreted in the saliva and can continue to be secreted for up to seven to eight weeks. And so therefore, the saliva... Um, as a dentist, we are also oral physicians. And as you know, we've been redeployed. Many dentists have been redeployed to go and work in the emergency rooms and go and work in the hospitals. Um, as a dentist, we are oral physicians and we should be looking at how we can help from that point of view. And I think in the future, when the saliva tests come through, we should be looking at testing our patients, um, doing the saliva tests as well. Because even though the patients will feel better, um, two, two or three weeks later, the disease progression can go on for eight weeks and um, you can continue to secrete saliva 
and with the virus, it's still shedding the virus. We know the risk factors now um, are cardiac disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, as well as uh, obesity. It seems that males are more affected than females, the elderly um, more so, but any age group can be affected. We want to prevent it, we want to identify, and we want to manage. And um, at the moment we are in lockdown and our practices are closed and we cannot see patients face to face. Um, this is due to the airborne generating procedures and the virus being transmitted in aerosols. Um, however, tooth whitening, it doesn't have any aerosol transmission. And what I'm going to talk about today is that tooth whitening has got a lot of oral health benefits. And at the moment, we can be providing this for our patients and I'll tell you how. Um, so there's emergency, um, there's emerging clinical insights for dentistry. It has, it's going to have impact on all, everything we do in dentistry going forward. We now have what's called a new normal because of how we'll be practicing in the future. A lot of it is really um, our new frontiers that we will be um, working with. We are now all used to using Zoom and in future we will do patient consultations on uh, Zoom as well. We will, we will not see patients until we've triaged them on the phone and doing Zoom consultations. Our waiting rooms will be changed. We won't have waiting rooms because our patients won't need to wait. We will be so organized that they will um, be we will be ready for them immediately. Our patient, the timings is going to be longer. The appointments are going to be longer. The cost is going to increase because there'll be a cost of key, uh, PPE. We're thinking that instead of, um, as a, in a private practice, instead of uh, increasing the cost, we will put a PPE charge um, extra on for our patients. And I think that is uh, a, a sensible way forward because patients would be only too delighted for us to wear all the um, enhanced advanced PPE. So that's something to look at. Um, and, and the way that we deliver dentistry going forward is gonna be very different. But what I wanted to talk to you about is that the tooth whitening contains hydrogen peroxide. And some of the studies have shown that hydrogen peroxide may be beneficial in reducing viral load. So what I want to talk about is what we can do now to help our patients. We will talk about uh, whitening and the benefits and using lower strength, but I, I also want to focus on sensitivity to sensitivity. So um, this is one of the papers that we produced in uh, 19, uh, to 2017, carbamide peroxide and the use in oral hygiene and oral health. At the moment, and I'm sure most of you have sent newsletters to your patients, um, and we are sending uh, weekly newsletters to our patients with updates. Updates on the PPE that we'll be wearing, updates on how practice will um, run, updates on new patient consultations, and keeping our patients safe. We are contacting the elderly patients, calling them, um, every week and triaging on the phone. Now, uh, carbamide peroxide, which is one of the main ingredients in the tooth whitening gel, has major oral health benefits. And at this time, we need to be encouraging our patients to be maintaining the best oral health that they can. And carbamide peroxide does that. The carbamide peroxide is what we know as the nighttime products. Carbamide peroxide elevates the pH in the mouth, helps with wound healing and um, soft tissue here. And yes, by the way, it also makes the teeth whiter, but we'll talk about that more. So this article here is called, we read it um, as a practice on the 13th of March. And after we read this paper, we realized that dentistry is going to be completely different the way we practice now. So um, it's called Peng 2020. And um, the Chinese dentist identified how they were practicing in Wuhan, how they were um, uh, practicing and the measure they were taking. They did mention that they were using agents such as 1% hydrogen peroxide and 0% povidone iodine for the purpose of reducing salary load of the oral microbes, potentially the, the reduction in the virus. Um, and hydrogen peroxide plays quite an important role and I want to look at that further. Of course, yes, we'll be using, when we are going back, we'll be using the rubber dam isolation on most, uh, most treatments, in fact, as many as we can. And we will be, they suggest here that you use an anti-retraction handpiece to reduce the aerosol generating procedures. Um, but I wanted to talk more in detail about carbamide peroxide. Carbamide peroxide is the whitening gel that we use, is also known as the home gel. And the benefits are of carbamide peroxide is it contains urea. 
urea breaks down and um, into um, ammonia and um, break down products of carbon dioxide, but the water it then becomes water and um, oxygen. So that goes from um, urea to carbon peroxide to urea to hydrogen peroxide to oxygen. Oxygen is the active ingredient. Now in this virus, our patients are oxygen short and they're hypoxic. And some of the diseases are li li uh, linked besides the pneumonia and the issues, it's to do with oxygen shortage. And um, hydrogen peroxide and oxygen brings oxygen to an area, so is beneficial at this time. It, um, so the carbamide helps with wound healing, with soft tissue irritation, uh, reduction in caries and root decay and tooth decay. It contains a product called carbapol, and carbapol is a slow-release oxygen agent. So all the way through the night, the oxygen remains active, and this is really beneficial. And so it's useful for patients to be using carbamide peroxide right now. And therefore, we can look at, even though we closed, those patients that have undertaken existing a whitening in the, in the recent future, in the recent past, we can look at helping them to maintain their oral health. We'll look at the, we can talk about what does the legislation say, but we'll talk about what we can actually do now. Um, so we call this term therapeutic aesthetics. Therapeutic aesthetics is using the therapeutic uh, benefits of the carbamide peroxide um, to heal the mouth, but also just by the way, whiten the teeth. Um, there is also improved gingival health, reduction in gingival swelling, improved oral hygiene, and improved oral health. So the patients, um, this helps the patients to maintain better oral health, which is very key at this time. We can also use this in uh, an orthodontic tray and a liner the patients can use the hydrogen peroxide as well, or the carbamide peroxide, but all the time it's, it's to do with reducing salivary load of the virus and the, uh, stop the virus from shedding, reduction in shedding. So here is a product which you can buy at the moment in the pharmacy all over. This is hydrogen peroxide 3%. It's about three pounds, this um, container, and you can buy it and use it as a mouthwash. You dilute it um, and put a tablespoon in water and the patient can be rinsing with that right now. This is also known to be a disinfectant and a decontaminant. So you can use it as a mouthwash and you've got peroxyl, um, which you can purchase from Colgate. But if you can't get peroxyl, because when we tried to order, they were out, you can use a hydrogen peroxide solution just like this and you can order this in bulk. Um, this can be used for surface disinfection, for mouth disinfection, from decontamination, for toothbrush disinfectant. So you can take your toothbrush, and this is what we're advising. We've written a newsletter, and I'm happy to give you a copy of the newsletter if you wish. Just uh, message me afterwards that we sent to our patient about how to disinfect their toothbrush. Number one, first of all, if they have had the virus, they should throw away their toothbrush because of the amount of viral shedding in the saliva. Um, but otherwise, uh, they should be disinfecting the toothbrush. Again, you take just a little and you use this cap here and you put um, pour the hydrogen peroxide in and the patient can put their toothbrush inside and just swish with that and decontaminate their toothbrush. And they can do that before their brush and on their brush. So um, it can also be used to treat minor mouth irritations. The, the purpose of hydrogen peroxide is that it brings oxygen to the site. So the foaming areas help to clean the area and this is beneficial. Um, so we wanted to look at the research. There's very little research on reduction in viral load, but there's a lot of research on um, the uh, killing of bacteria with the hydrogen peroxide. So that is why. This is one of the studies, Camp et al., which was published a few weeks ago about using hydrogen peroxide as surface disinfection. They use 60%, uh, 62% ethanol, hydrogen peroxide, half a percent, and sodium hypochlorite to deactivate the surfaces. They found that in one minute, these surfaces were deactivated uh, with a coronavirus, um, against the coronavirus. And also, um, in some countries, they're using the hydrogen peroxide just to spray down the surgery. So we're just looking at these new protocols, and we're trying to look at the research and evidence. But it seems the way we're going to be working from now on is we will, besides the heavy PPE that we'll be wearing, we may be using the hydrogen peroxide um, prior to commencing any treatment as a mouthwash, 
and also as a decontaminant. So I would order quite a few of these um, hydrogen peroxide solution, 3%. Uh, not expensive and you can get that from your lo local pharmacy and most of them are, um, they do have them in, in place. Um, they are in stock. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide the, is also placed in ear drops and eye drops for neonates. And that's relevant when we talk about tooth whitening for under 18s. So um, we wanted to look at who could be benefit, uh, benefiting from hydrogen peroxide as an oral health healer at the moment. So um, at the moment, for example, our patients in ortho or in aligners can be using the hydrogen peroxide mouthwash to clean their appliances and to put in the carbamide peroxide, the uh, whitening gel to clean their appliances and to use it overnight again to improve their oral health. Any at-risk group who has who is susceptible to poor oral health, such as the elderly who have oral health challenges or impaired manual dexterity, a good idea is to make them a bleaching tray. We call it a therapeutic tray. And the patient will put in the carbamide peroxide every night when they sleep as a purpose of reduction in bacterial load. And um, just by the way, yes, the teeth will be whiter. But this is really key in managing um, to improve patients' oral health. Patients who have high caries, um, tooth decay and root decay as well, the carbamide peroxide helps to heal that. This is shown to be very beneficial. Special care patients, patients who are undergoing chemotherapy, immunocompromised patients, uh, patients with xerostomia, all of them can benefit from using the bleaching tray as a vehicle to deliver uh, materials that can reduce the, um, the infection in the mouth. So just if you've had your, if you know that your patients have had the disease, um, you can advise them number one, to throw away the toothbrush. Number two, we know that it continues to shed um, for up to seven to eight weeks in the saliva. So they should be changing their toothbrush once a week. And if they have had the virus, um, they should be decontaminating their toothbrush with 3% hydrogen peroxide. You fill it in a cap and they um, switch that. They put the toothbrush into the um, hydrogen peroxide prior to brushing. And they can continue to do that while, this is, while we are still in the, uh, the pandemic. What we know about hydrogen peroxide is that it releases oxygen and the oxygen penetrates into the, into the tooth, but also penetrates through the saliva and helps the ginger, the ginger as well. And it can cause, this is the one major research study, which is called Yo et al, 2013. And this study looked at the, the um, it was an in vitro study, but it looked at the antibacterial effect of carbamide peroxide on the bacterial cell membrane. And they noted that carbamide peroxide was more bactericidal than chlorhexidine. So therefore, developing a new protocol where you use rather um, carbamide peroxide in a bleaching tray for, to, for the patient to improve their oral health at this time is really key. And um, please look at that and ways to develop, we call it therapeutic aesthetics for your patients now while our practices are closed, because you can still send them the gel if they have their bleaching trays. Um, and that this is some way to, to build some income for the practice at this very dire situation. But, um, Professor Van Hewitt recommends that you can do both. You can use uh, 30, you can rinse your mouth first of all with Corsidil, and then you can use the um, carbamide peroxide. But 10% carbamide peroxide in a tray as an oral health a uh, um, improver is really key. Another thing you can do that if you've had patients who have um, peri-implantitis, uh, of course not your patients, but somebody else's patient is transferred, you can use the bleaching tray and give them, make them a bleaching tray over the implant and give them 10% carbamide peroxide to heal the inflammation of the gingiva. And this works really effectively as well. There's a lot of research that's been published on this. Um, to use this protocol and a technique. Another way of uh, reducing sensitivity, again, it has no aerosol generating procedure. And these kind of things we need to look at at this time um, is using silver, the use of silver diamine fluoride. Silver diamine fluoride has two benefits. One is that it uh, reduces, it's used for reduction in sensitivity. So this may be a, a treatment that you'll be doing now a lot more while we have restriction on aerosol generating procedures. But a major 
a major factor is the treatment of decay uh, with sulfur diamine fluoride. Basically, you place, you, you place the liquid onto the carious area and in front of your eyes, it just crystallizes. Um, the decay crystallizes, it's, it's pretty unique material. A lot of research, we've just had a publication um, being accepted in the British Dental Journal about this, but it, it, in the UK, it's classified as a treatment for sensitivity. Here is uh, what we would do here for the elderly patient is we would give them amorphous calcium phosphate, which is tooth mousse. And you can apply the tooth mousse again inside your bleaching tray for the benefits of healing the mouth, delivering fluoride, calcium and phosphate to the teeth to strengthen them at this time. So for any of your at-risk patients, this would be an excellent treatment to deliver. So if they've had whitening previously, they can use their bleaching tray as a therapeutic agent to deliver um, benefits for improvement in oral health. Um, what we would do on our patients, I don't believe that our patients should be sensitive and we should leave our patients in sensitivity. So what I, when we do tooth whitening, we are also involved in the sensitivity business because up to 85% of patients can experience quite significant sensitivity during whitening. And um, the way that we approach it is we would assess it quite carefully for the patient. But a lot of the time, we place resin modified glass onomers on the class 5 lesions. So many patients these days have these class 5 lesions. Most of the time, it is due to the fact that they are brushing too aggressively or have got a new electric toothbrush. But there's a lot of class 5 areas. M many dentists just ignore it and um, tell them to use Sensodyne. But I tend to inter, um, intervene and are proactive and replace the class five lesions prior to making a bleaching tray. And um, so please consider that. And we would use the pumice and hibby scrub. And then we would place this on. Again, using a slow hand piece at this time is aerosol generating. So um, the reduction, you, other products can help uh, reduce that. The, here is a patient who, where we used her existing bleaching tray and we placed amorphous calcium phosphate. This is an elderly patient who had a reconstruction and um, to prevent decay, we gave them um, amorphous calcium phosphate in their bleaching tray and they wear that sometimes on the upper and sometimes on the lower. They have a protocol, 5% carbamide peroxide one night, um, amorphous calcium phosphate, tooth mousse another night, um, sometimes the upper, sometimes the lower. But this is a new way of delivering this. Um, we know also that, com that amorphous calcium phosphate has got a lot of benefits. Um, this is ACP and MI paste because it uh, encourages remineralization and reversal of caries lesions. So topical application at the moment, while we are triaging our patients, we are trying to help them manage their sensitivity and manage any pain. And we hope that they don't have um, abscesses, but we are trying to manage patient sensitivity. And again, the supply of amorphous calcium phosphate using this in their bleaching tray will help to reduce any sensitivity that they are experiencing now. And on top of which, amorphous calcium phosphate has a fluoride and um, calcium and phosphate to strengthen the teeth. So here is the practice. It is very quiet at the moment because we have no patients, but we are going in every day to switch on um, the machines, to run the machines, to triage our patients, to supply um, the temporary, temporary cement or temporary fillings or whitening gel, depending on what they need. Um, the, here are our upper trees and the whole upper trees will be kind of redesigned for how we're gonna be practicing now. So let's take a patient on a journey of whitening. Here we see somebody for the first time, and now we're going to do our triaging online and uh, with our video consultations. But we would look at the whites of the eyes versus the color of the teeth to see whether or not we're going to be successful with whitening. Here we can see on this patient, the teeth are much more yellow than the whites of the eyes, and we can see that we will be successful possibly. But we don't say anything, we're just looking at the stage to see what is achievable. At the end of treatment, we want to have the whites of the eyes matching the color of the teeth. Some patients have got quite severe and extreme uh, discoloration, and I want to talk a little bit about that today. So this is this patient's discoloration, which is pretty severe. This patient has fluorosis. With fluorosis, 
they have um, many, many, many different discolorations and the discolorations are brown, orange um, markings, white markings as well. Now for this particular patient, what we did first was we um, removed this old composite restoration with a surflex disc to get back to the existing enamel. Then we took the, undertook the whitening procedure using 10% carbamide peroxide. On a case like this, this is advanced discoloration. So the bleaching treatment is going to be advanced bleaching. And therefore, it's going to take us nine to possibly nine to 12 weeks of whitening. And that you need to explain that to the patient and how we will be doing the treatment. The treatment protocol, if you want to write this down, is that we always treat the upper teeth first. Upper teeth whitening first because the upper teeth uh, whiten quicker, the upper teeth are less sensitive, and then you've got a color control. And um, the way that we do that is we just deliver, sometimes we just deliver the upper tray. Now we would deliver up and lower, but only the upper teeth first. And um, because the upper teeth widen quicker than the lower, the patient has quite an easy journey. And so we want to help the patient um, manage their treatment and um, have an easy, an easy journey at the beginning. So they would use the whitening for at least two weeks, and then they would return and we would review the situation. At that stage, we can decide either continue to further whiten the teeth, or we will introduce the lower whitening. The lower whitening is long, takes longer, and that's normally three weeks overnight use. And the, um, the lower whitening is more sensitive. We think the reason for this is patients grind their teeth a lot, and on the lower incisors, they tend to be more sensitive. So we would do three weeks upper whitening on a patient like this, three weeks lower whitening, and it may be that we whiten the upper and lower together for a week at a time. So here is the final result. I'm sure you'll, um, you'll agree with me that it's a much improved situation. What we did for this patient is we did microabrasion afterwards where we used 6% um, opalaster paste, 6% hydrochloric acid onto the surface of the teeth to uh, reduce the rest of the white spots. But while you do this treatment, first it's the brown marks that go away, then the orange marks go away, then you're lightening up the actual color of the tooth. And as you continue to lighten, you will notice that even the white spots can disappear. Some of the white spots remineralize. So you continue for whitening for quite a while until you've managed to achieve uh, a good result. In the beginning, there may be a slow result and then it continues, but you need to, with these advanced patients, uh, continue for quite an extended period of time. So um, let's talk about classification of bleaching treatments. A basic case is when no restorative dentistry required and you need to do home bleaching for four to six weeks to achieve a B1 shade. An intermediate case would be some restorative dentistry required. Maybe afterwards you need to change composite restorations to a new shade such as class three restorations. Um, and that would be six to eight weeks to achieve a B1 shade. And advanced discoloration such as I just showed you. So that's fluorosis, um, tetracycline staining, it, or you have, we put into this category patients who've had um, existing sensitivity. If they have existing sensitivity, then the way that we would deal with this is we'd make them a bleaching tray first, like we're talking about therapeutic aesthetics, and we would apply, give them the patient a desensitizing gel to use a proprietary desensitizing gel. And they would use the desensitizer for an ha a half an hour before whitening, a half an hour after whitening, or instead of whitening. So there's three current desensitizers on the UK market. One is called Relief Gel, one is called Ultra Ease, and one is called Polar Soothe. All these products have got um, fluoride, potassium nitrate, and um, the relief gel has got a little bit of ACP as well. But when you classify these treatments into these three basic types, then basic, intermediate, and advanced, this helps you in terms of timing and treatment expectations. Plus also, it will help us with the um, costings because um, the, uh, the intermediate treatments will take longer, advanced and complex discoloration longer. So we need to be supplying more gel and give the patient more time. So let's look at a basic bleaching case. A basic bleaching case, as we discussed, no restorative dentistry is required. Um, and we would take the patient um, from an A3 to a B1. 
Now, when we are talking about how do we get to do more whitening cases, many dentists say to me, I don't like selling dentistry. I would say to you, every single patient that you see from your examinations, you just measure their shade. You do what we call an A3 audit. Everybody has, um, we measure it. And all you need to do, you don't need to do a complex, um, complex assessment, but you take the A3 shade and you can see, are they lighter or darker than A3 as a basic as a basic start. Patient may say, oh, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And we can show them the lighter shades, but it, it leads to a discussion. And once you document shades and patients kind of know their shade, um, this really helps uh, to do more tooth whitening. This particular patient has got uh, smokes. Um, he has a lot of fried food and um, he has got a deeper discoloration. So diet is a major factor as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. And here we whitened again, four to six weeks to whiten, first the upper, then the lower, and we were able to achieve a nice result. Have a look at the improvement in his gingival health because of the whitening. This particular patient has got gray stain on the teeth and the gray, in, inherent gray color, it's, it's actually inherent inside, often can take a, a longer time to whiten. So we would, um, again, the same protocol, here is the final result, and these results, ladies and gentlemen, are 10 to 12 years later. The whitening can last a long time. And you may say to me, well, how long does it actually last? Um, and the answer when you're talking to patients is, it depends. But actually, what we find is if you reach the bleaching potential of the tooth by going into the dentine, into the enamel, and doing the whitening for this period of time, four to six weeks, you will reach the bleaching potential where you don't need to keep topping up and topping up. If you reach the bleaching potential with these successful cases, this is called the Van Hayward, the Professor Hayward technique of whitening, um, you will be able to achieve a long lasting whitening. The research studies that they published show that even after 17 years, the shade never went back to the existing shade. The problem that many dentists ex, um, find is that they use too high concentration of whitening gel. And so the teeth, they whiten quickly, but they regress quickly. So what you want to do is use a, a slow controlled method of whitening to get deeper whitening so you can have a long lasting effect. So this particular patient has got um, internal, a, a non-vital tooth over here. This is non-vital and she's cracked these teeth here. So first we did non-vital bleaching and then we did vital bleaching. And we did this 15 years ago and every three years she, um, she tops up her whitening to continue to maintain it at that level. This particular patient had um, iron staining from a lot of, uh, she lost, she had an accident and she lost her spleen. So she had to have a lot of iron uh, medication for three years, which caused her teeth to discolor. So, Medical history is totally relevant, and we knew this was going to take a longer period of time, so we put her into the intermediate category. The next patient has got quite severe brown stain on the teeth, on top of which they had a lot of recession here. So as, as I showed you before, we would often just cover this over prior to starting, and we need to assess, first of all, their levels of sensitivity. And because of these deep shades, we knew it was going to take longer. So we put them into an intermediate category and that helps us to plan and treatment plan better. So this particular patient um, has got the uh, fluorosis and now you know the protocol, which is nine to 12 weeks of whitening. First the upper, then the lower. So there'll be a period of time, maybe two weeks where they're whitening upper teeth and lower teeth in the trays. So we like them to actually go all the way through the night. And we instruct our patients because carbon mite peroxide is active all the way through the night. We instruct the patients how to place the gel and they put it in just before they go to sleep in the, in the bleaching tray and they would uh, wear it all the way through the night. If the patient says that they cannot, um, they cannot tolerate it all the way through the night, then we say to them, why don't you use it for two hours at a time? And that will get this um, contact time. It won't be a, the whitening as quickly, but it gives you a, a good start. And here's the final result. Can you see that the teeth are nice and shiny? And the reason that they're shiny is because afterwards we did microabrasion and we polished the enamel, um, abraded the surface very gently using 6% hydrochloric acid over luster technique. Now this young girl we treated recently and um, she has quite severe fluorosis on her teeth and she was being teased at school. And um, 
just we treated her last uh, in, just before the end of the summer term, the uh, end of the yeah, and um, we whitened her first, whitened the upper teeth, then the lower, and she wanted to make sure that she could go into school and into, into her final week of junior school, primary school, and sh and show her beautiful new white teeth because she was teased a lot, and it was quite heartbreaking that this child had been teased so much because of this discoloration. Yes, she's going to need ortho, but for the child's mental well-being, this was the key thing which we undertook for the patient. We can talk a little bit later, if there's time, about whitening for under 18s. But the General Dental Council have said that it is, um, if there's treatment of disease, then you can undertake whitening. And this is treatment of disease. We've written a paper, which is on, the, um, on my website, just download it on the 10 categories when whitening is appropriate for under 18. So we're not really concerned about not um, about avoiding whitening for under 18s. So let's look now. You know that tooth whitening has been around for 31 years. What has happened in that time? Number one, our patients' expectations have increased and that can be a problem. And it's up to us to really discuss with the patients how to manage the expectations and reduce the expectations. Many patients seek whiter and whiter teeth. They want the extreme whiteness that they can get. And they have a philosophy that everything should be perfect. I think maybe some of those patients who try to have a perfect life are, have realized now that there's some things which you can't control, particularly global pandemics. It's un, out of their control. And hopefully this philosophy of perfection, having a perfect life, will change a little bit as the patient becomes more reasonable and rational in terms of what is possible and limiting expectations. Um, but we now can treat more difficult discolorations. Um, we can treat tetracycline, deep fluorosis, MIH patients. It just takes a little bit longer. So we have no age restrictions for elderly patients. And as I said, very beneficial to do tooth whitening for these elderly patients right now, right this time. We'll talk about, about the law and what the law says about um, examining patients for whitening, but I feel confident to be able to treat under 18s, especially if they have a dental disease and they have um, and they were suffering because they've been teased about their uh, discoloration. So, in terms of whitening maintenance, as I said, many patients can have a really long-lasting result if we reach the bleaching potential. And in hygiene, normally we would reassess them and decide when it would be appropriate to whiten again and to top up the whitening. Now, if they top up the whitening, they only would do it for about three days or seven days. But we bring, we are, when we do top ups of whitening, we ask them to bring the tray back. We fit the tray, we fit the tray and check the tray again, because often if the patient would have been grinding, they've ground a hole through the tray, or you may have done restorative dentistry, and so the trays don't fit and need to be replaced. One thing about the trays is we do not need reservoirs. We can just have a tightly fitting tray. The reservoirs uh, actually add bulk to the tray and we want to have a tightly fitting tray. So um, there are many different designs and many manufacturers tell you that you must use their designs, but actually an, uh, an aligner is also fine. We have another category of patients called bleacherexic or bleacherholics who overly obsessed with the color of their teeth and they constantly seek whiter and whiter teeth. Now those patients we can tell because those are the ones whose eyes, um, the teeth are whiter than the whites of the eyes. And they're very clever in the way that they approach us because they, be, within three seconds, they become our new best friend and particularly friendly with the receptionist bringing chocolates, et cetera, because they want us to supply them with gel. And there's very specific legislation and discussions about that and what we can do. Um, but we now know that it's not just a two week treatment. It's only beginning at two weeks and needs to continue for more effective deeper whitening. The therapeutic use of the trays should be considered now. And those patients that I know well, that we've been looking after their teeth for a long time, we are supplying them with gel in their trays to do the whitening because at the moment, people are focusing on self-care and self-care and mouth care go together, really important for their resilience. And this is the perfect time to re-whiten the teeth because of the oral health benefits. There are uh, whitening strips which are introduced, but we like the bleaching trays to help improve oral health for our patients.
Yes, there are changes in legislation about which concentrations we can use. You don't need the heat, you don't need a light, you don't need a laser and you don't need ozone. You can just have a bleaching tray and um, the gel. But you can use some of these techniques to enhance your procedures. But the basic technique is using the home tray. Now, I'm happy for you to take a photo of this because this is a nice summary of how um, everything that we need to do to do a dental examination for whitening. The key is that there should be exclusion of pathology. Really, really key. And so it's our responsibility to check for that. Um, we need to get a detailed medical history with a detail of the medication patients take because it's my experience that the more medication they take, the more discoloration or the longer period of time that they've taken the medication, the more likelihood of discoloration, particularly for multiple, um, if, they are, if they're taking multiple medications. The next important thing is that um, dental history is really key. So we want to know about trauma um, or previous trauma in any way. We want to know whether or not they've had orthodontic treatment. Um, we then want to discuss the patient's hopes and aspirations with the patient, um, what, what they're trying to achieve in terms of whiteness, um, we would use a shade guide to measure that. And we would also use this device, which is a really nice device, um, a computerized device, but it's called the Vita Easy Shade. It measures the amount of whitening. It measures the whitening potential. It measures the colors and particularly helpful for when you are placing crowns to help to select the whiteness. It can tell you on the three different parts of the tooth, the color. And it's very helpful so that you don't have to have remakes of shades because the shades are wrong. Now, when we are talking about sensitivity, we need to decide, and especially at this moment, does the patient have pain or is it sensitivity, an existing sensitivity? That's what, not what, I, what I'm talking about, is what we want to know prior to whitening, does the patient have any existing sensitivity? Because the existing sensitivity needs to be managed prior to whitening. We want to also examine the teeth for cracks and check for a patient is bruxing. We want to know about previous ortho. We want to measure the gingival health. And patients who've got black cracks on their teeth from smoking and uh, grinding their teeth, often if they've got a long black crack, you will not be able to get the black crack out of, out of the teeth. And again, that's reducing expectations. Some patients who have dehydration lines where they've got a high smile line, and as they age, the enamel gets thinner. Some of those patients, again, you may not be able to get the um, dehydration line away. What we really are new to look for is any draining sinuses or periapical pathology. That's what, we, what it means in terms of the legislation. The legislation says you need to exclude pathology. So every patient needs to have pathology excluded. Now, when we are in lockdown, we cannot check our patient's teeth. We can do our, um, we can use the phone and we can check on the phone and we can do Zoom consultations, but we can't do clinical examinations. Um, but what we want to know is coming back to, do they have pain in their teeth, palpitis, or is it sensitivity? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. I've given you some strategies already to manage their sensitivity. Um, we would then take radiology, we would do x-rays, and the rule for x-rays is that any discolored tooth needs a periapical radiograph. It's very, very important that you know what the pathology is like, because some patients just have a minor um, widening of the periapical area, which is beginning of a um, of inflammation in the root and the nerve, and we need to know that. So we want to do vitality testing and percussion and palpation. If you were to put oxygen into an anaerobic area where there's, there's undiagnosed periapical lesion, you can cause a flare up, and this patient then becomes sensitive and um, you can flare up and an abscess can develop because of that. So we mentioned to assess the etiology. So some patients we would for sensitivity. First of all, what is causing the sensitivity and why? So we would ask the patients four questions and we can do that during our telephone triage. We would say to them, do you have any sensitivity to cold? Because sensitivity to cold will, need, will normally mean they have some gingival recession. Do you have any sensitivity to heat? Because the heat may be palpitis in one tooth. Do you have any sensitivity to sweet? The sweet would indicate whether or not they had decay in a tooth. 
And do you have any sensitivity to cold and pain on biting at the same time? Because that could indicate a crack. Now, during this time of the COVID um, crisis and pandemic, many patients are stressed and worried and have a lot of anxiety. And so more so they are grinding and clenching their teeth. And thank goodness for bike plates and Michigan splints, but a lot of our patients need to be wearing Michigan splints at this time because of the um, because of the great stress that they are experiencing. And um, so they are clenching and causing more cracks. Um, so coming back to that, I mentioned earlier that you can make a bleaching tray and you can give your patients desensitizing, proprietary desensitizing agents, and we can um, discuss that a little bit later. Sometimes the sensitivity is so severe that we do need to do gingival grafting, but first we would be assessing with using um, soothing gels. Now, one of the techniques which has been described in the literature is to give your patient desensitizing toothpaste to use for two weeks prior to whitening. Now, you can use either the Sensodyne, which has Novamin inside, or the Colgate, which has Arginine inside. These products are tubular blockers, so they block the open dentinal tubules to stop and reduce the sensitivity. But we often tell, tell our patients to change brands so that they become, so they're not just um, used to one type of tubular blocker, that they can be uh, protected in different ways. As well as Duraflat, you can use the high Duraflat um, the fluoride toothpaste. So we mentioned that you may want to do restorative treatment and I cover over the exposed dentinal tubules um, either with a resin modified glass onomer with SDF or a Gloomer and Hurry Seal, which is an immediate dentine sealer. So these are the four questions. And while you're um, asking the patients, get clarification because for some patients, they go, oh, yes, my teeth are sensitive, and they really mean they've got a major toothache. So we need to get clarification so we can understand exactly what type of sensitivity these patients are experiencing. So this is one of the soothing gels. This is called Ultra Ease, and this is from Optident. And Ultra Ease contains potassium nitrate. The way potassium nitrate works, it, it calms the nerves down. Um, by penetrating the nerve, it stops, stops the tr transmission of the nerve impulse, and basically, after depolarizing, it cannot repolarize, so it reduces the sensitivity. And so we have um, potassium nitrate and they contain fluoride. So fluoride blocks the tubules and potassium nitrate stops the excitability of the nerve. So you may say to me, okay, well, Linda, that's all very well, but um, if you're putting fluoride and you're blocking the tubules, how can that still help with whitening? The whitening molecule, the oxygen is so tiny that it can get embedded inside and you can pay, uh, bypass the fluoride and it's not a problem. They also have disposable fluoride trays and uh, a potassium nitrate trays that you can get from Optident where you can apply this uh, for sensitivity management. We can also use this if we are doing power whitening. In the middle of power whitening, we can stop, remove the gel and place these desensitizing strips on for the patients. So for example, this particular patient, um, not only do they have um, tetracycline staining type one, but they also have a lot of recession and deep class five lesions. So what we did for this patient, we filled all these areas prior to whitening over here with resin modified glass onoma. We would use a shade A1 resin modified glass onoma. So Reva, um, Reva, or we would use Fuji 2, Fuji 9, any of the resin modified glass onomers, they're all excellent. I prefer that rather than a, a composite restoration because the composite restorations can stain um, and you get black staining around the edges. And um, the Reva and the Fuji is quite translucent, so it takes up the color of the root and protects it. You're never going to get perfect whitening on the root anyway. So we, again, we need to limit the expectations of the patients to understand exactly how, um, how this occurs. But we would cover over all of these. Let me show you the technique. We would do retraction cord here, uh, a double retraction cord. You can see the deep lesion. Often the ginger covers over and it looks like a, a small lesion, but actually when you put the retraction cord in, you can see how deep it is. Um, so we would clean this first, we put the retraction cord in and we would clean with pumice and heavy scrub. I use pumice in a micro brush and clean this area. Um, and we used to use the 
um, materials with the Novamin inside air scaling, but at the moment we'd use pumice and hairy scrub, then we would double etch. The reason that we double etch these areas is that there's secondary and tertiary dentine here and it's difficult to etch. So we double etch and agitate in this area. Then we would clean it and place hurry seal. Hurry seal is an intermediate dentine um, um, restoration and debonding a, a, a bonding agent, but also it's for sealing. So you can use gloomer or you can use hurry seal after we've taken the etch off and washed the etch off. Then we would place the uh, resin modified glass onoma and we would uh, polish and contour. Then we would take our impressions for the bleaching tray. So these are the two products that we use for desensitizing all the way through whitening. But we would use this, we use this for all restorative procedures. Everything, every time we etch, the next thing we would do is we place hurry seal. And it used to have benzanthoconium chloride. It has to be removed because that is, it's not permissible in Europe that's been taken away. Um, but it's a HEMA solution, that's the hurry seal, or you can use Gloomer as an effective treatment. So here is the treatment afterwards. And we also did some, later on, we did some gingival, um, some grafting on the teeth. So a new patient comes to your practice and they want to do whitening. And um, they've previously had orthodontic treatment and they no, have no symptoms, but they just want to improve the look. They're not happy with the present shade and they noticed that the anterior diastema has opened up. So we take a radiograph and we see on the radiograph that not only are the teeth um, resorbed, but they're very short, they're quite severely resorbed. So we have what's called the moment of truth where we've got to discuss with the patient exactly what we see, but um, not like hairdressers used to say, oh my gosh, she was your last hairdresser. With this, we can't do that. We need to describe in a gentle way to the patient to deliver bad news of what we see, what is happening, and what are the options, including extraction plus implants. But the, the radiographs are absolutely essential to help us diagnose effectively. So on this particular patient, can you see this tooth is a little bit more yellow than the tooth than the neighboring tooth? This had some type of pathology and it's up to us to examine and, and observe whether the teeth have different shades. So we um, looked at that over here, and um, the story is the patient had power whitening, then they came uh, started with a home whitening, and after that, they developed pain. On the third day, the patient developed pain. We know that the most sensitivity patients have during whitening is on the third day, and we think that's due to maximum saturation of oxygen inside. So the dentist took a radiograph, and this is the radiograph, and you can see there's a lesion. And then they did a nice root canal, but the point is we need to diagnose this first prior to undertaking whitening treatment. So let's look at all the reasons why you get discoloration. And again, just take a photo of this uh, and tag me on Instagram, Prenal Dental. But um, these are the reasons why why you get discoloration and it's important for us to understand. So um, there's extrinsic causes, intrinsic causes and other causes. When it comes to extrinsic, any stain on plaque stain on the teeth can cause the teeth to go yellow, but that is transient and can be removed with a good dental cleaning. Tea and coffee can stain and uh, tea is worse than coffee. Red wine also can be staining them. And patients who've had high fevers, they can get staining due to the antibiotics, which again can be extrinsic as opposed to intrinsic. So smoking can cause this as well. Patients who have poor oral hygiene can often get chromogenic bacteria where the plaque is green. And um, this is new research. We know that patients who have a lot of dairy, the children who have a lot of dairy, they can get black staining um, around in the upper primary molars, and this is due to iron um, connecting with the dairy. So in terms of intrinsic, any time a patient has had um, internal bleeding or trauma or liver disease or kidney disease um, would cause some type of staining, um, intrinsic discoloration of the tooth. Patients having antibiotics at a young age, such as prior to the age of three years old or even older. We now know Roaccutane, this is a new drug which is given for acne medication and this, um, this can cause the teeth to go gray. If you Google Roaccutane, 
um, FDA truth discoloration, you will see how many reports of discoloration are in the literature. And many of our um, dermatologists don't know about the tooth discoloration. Again, it's our responsibility to explain that to the dermatologist. So if they're on long-term medication, minocycline is a common one for acne and tetracycline, they take doxytetracycline, this needs to be reduced because tetracycline has a cumulative effect on adult dentine. We also know that amoxyl, given at a young age, can cause white, small white stripes, little cloud-like formations along the enamel surface. Um, patients with iron staining, copper staining, common thing is those patients who swim a lot, professional swimmers in the water for four hours a day, they can get green discoloration of their teeth due to the chlorine in the water, and it depends on the chlorine um, concentration. So in terms of other factors, we know one in six children now have white spots on their teeth, and this is increasing, 25 to 40% increase in white spots on the children's teeth that are, that are erupting. And this is anything that happened prenatally, perinatally or postnatally, any medication that the patients were taking can cause white spots on the teeth. Any, and any chemicals administrated, um, given, especially bisphenol A. Bisphenol A is found in plastic in, um, and the water bottles. And so there's a really new, a good uh, research report in the latest European Journal of Prosthodontics talking about bisphenol A and its impact on dentistry. So please have a look at that. Bisphenol A is also in composite restorations. So anytime that anything that happens prenatally, perinatally or postnatally to a child or the mother can have caused the white spots and we need to deal with that. That's why we mentioned that we would have to uh, place whites, um, do whitening first and then we would do resin infiltration or microabrasion. So here, for example, this child, sorry, this child has got white spots on the teeth because they had multiple um, multiple medications with amoxyl with earaches and um, with multiple earaches. And so the, here we can see the amoxyl being incorporated into the enamel lines, on top of which the patient has some um, hyper, um, hypermineralization in these areas. Again, whitening first, always whitening first, then we can look at resin infiltration for these patients. Another factor is amalgam. Um, we know that amalgam staining um, amalgam can cause an increase in um, the mercury. When you do whitening, you can have an increase in mercury release. Did you know that? And so um, this was from right from the early stages from 1991 when whitening started, the new treatments were uh, provided. So is this relevant? It's relevant if a patient tells you that they're trying to fall pregnant or having fertility treatment, that is not a time to do whitening, particularly if they've got a lot of amalgams. And you decide that the, when you get the most mercury released is during when you remove the amalgam. So you need to make, uh, discuss all these options with patients. Mm -hmm. But I have stopped three patients from whitening because they were either pregnant or um, had had miscarriages or um, were having fertility treatments. So it's rather important, more important to have a healthy baby than to whiten the teeth at this time. So can you see this bleaching tray for the patient? What can you notice? Over here is the amalgam restoration, here, here, and here. So the black oxide layer is removed during the whitening procedure. And the patients, I didn't know about this initially, and the patient said, you know, when I take out my bleaching tray, there's a little black star inside, and this is what it looks like, and here it is, there is the amalgam. So we need to be aware of this, and we can have a gentle discussion. We don't want to pay, uh, make the patients uh, overly concerned, but it needs to be a relevant discussion. The new shade guides that we should be using are these Vita bleaching 3D masters. The shade guides that we currently use are 55 years out of date. It's not a scientific measure, the Vita Classic. This is a scientific measure on the value shade from the lightest to the darkness and the whitest shade. Um, the research has been conducted by Dr. Rada Paravina at the University of Texas, and here is his textbook with Stephen Chu. So please have a look at that. It's a really excellent textbook. And so what we are looking at is how white are we going to go and what are we able to achieve? We have a new shade, which is not on the other shade guide, which is called Toilet Bowl White. And um, some of our patients are trying to achieve this shade, which is um, not always possible. And some of the um, contestants of this famous television show 
um, wanted this shade of white. And so I don't think that they had home whitening. They may have had veneers. And I know Jack went to Turkey to have his veneers. Super white. And on this lady, we see that her teeth are almost uh, a new shade called Love Island Blue. We need to identify this for our patients and discuss it and, and also discuss the benefits of whitening versus veneers because whitening is minimal invasive. Veneers, whatever you do, even if you don't prep, is an intervention. So let's look at tetracycline whitening now. Um, again, there was a, a, um, a TV show recently with a celebrity who was um, focused on her tetracycline uh, teeth and she mentioned this on Instagram. And um, so there's been a lot of interest in tetracycline discoloration. This particular patient here has got um, tetracycline, mild tetracycline staining. Here is the result after six weeks. The way that we can tell this is that on the necks of the teeth, so this is quite a mild gray shade, but on the necks of the teeth, he has a deep orange shade. And this is how we can tell that this is tetracycline stain as opposed to mild gray stain. What I wanted to show you, can you see those white spots here? These white spots are where the whitening gel has been taken up too quickly. These are porous areas. So if you go back and look at this photo, you can't see the porosity on the teeth. And this is here is where the whitening gel is taken up too quickly. You need to reassure the patient to say absolutely fine and encourage them it will go away. It just takes a bit of time. So now we have um, type two tetracycline. This is a deeper shade, deeper brown shade. And this patient had whitening and simple bonding just over here to improve that. Again, how long does this take? This takes three, six, nine or 12 months is a long period of time. But um, the patients need to, you need to discuss that with the patients. If you look on this patient here, there's quite a deep stain. There's deep banding in the middle of the tooth. And this deep banding will help us identify in terms of predicting prognosis, how successful we will be. If the band is particularly on the cervical area, that's much harder to treat as if the, if the banding is on the incisal tip. So with this patient, no guarantees that we could get the banding out. Um, he's grinding his teeth quite a lot. We didn't, we say, we don't know how long it's gonna take. It could take three, six or nine months, depending. Here you can see the orange necks of the teeth and with him he had sensitivity, so we covered those over with glossoonomers. And then finally at the end of treatment, we were able to, able to place some composite restorations in a simple way for the patient, improve things, make him a bite plate as well. So um, what we wanted to talk about is where does the whitening occur? Does it occur inside the dentine or does it occur inside the enamel? And we know that actually it occurs in both. We used to think that whitening was a semi-permeable membrane, uh, sorry, the enamel is a semi-permeable membrane, but actually the whitening goes inside, it lightens the enamel, and then it lightens the dentine of the tooth. And this is a really excellent research study and that has shown that. Here with this patient, we removed the old composite restorations, we whitened, and then we placed glass on him. And this patient was particularly sensitive, which so we needed to first manage the sensitivity. And that's why I wanted to talk today to you about sensitivity plus whitening, because up to 85% of uh, patients experience sensitivity during whitening. And we have a lot of patients that can be up to 70 to 80% have existing sensitivity. So on this patient here, these two teeth are root treated, but the patient had sensitivity in these areas here where the recession was. And she came to see me, she was crying because she was um, concerned about these teeth and wanted to look at the options. So this radiograph shows that there are issues and she's got some unusual shaped posts inside, the endo is not 100%, um, but really what we did for her is first we made provisional crowns, mm -hmm. then we um, placed also the, um, we placed resin modified glass on on all these areas that were sensitive, then we made her a bleaching tray and we were able to do successful whitening. Here we are using the Vita Easy Shade, um, and this is measuring the helping us to measure the final shade. You can do this treatment where you whiten the neck and the core and the stump of the tooth. Did you know that? And so you can make provisional crowns join together. Take the patient takes off the provisionals at night, places the whitening gel in this area, and then puts the provisionals back. And can do that for a week and come back and see you. Um, and then here is the final results like this. So we did the final crowns. Uh, here's a resin modified glass onoma, much improved appearance. Patients delighted.
So we'll just talk a little bit now about how does whitening work. The whitening is the hydrogen peroxide that breaks down into oxygen and water. And the oxygen gets within to the nerve within 5 to 15 minutes. Did you know that? And so that is why we need to really carefully assess these patients for their um, sensitivity prior to, to treatment or whether we need to assess if they have existing sensitivity, manage it, treat it prior to treatment, and then you can place bleaching, um, give them proprietary soothers inside the whitening trays prior to undertaking treatment. Um, these are some of the common products available on the, in the UK. And we cannot use the high strength. We can use, according to the legislation, up to 16% carbamide. And these are the products around. And all of them are effective treatments. We now have a lower concentration, 5% carbamide peroxide, which is called Novon Mild. And as particularly at this time, we can be using this product for um, improvement in gingival health and improvement in oral hygiene for patients. This treatment, um, the product's called White Kin. It's, um, it's toothpaste and whitening gel. And it comes in a double barrel syringe with the, um, like a toothpaste that the patient brushes onto the surface of the tooth. The benefits is it's got lactoperoxidase, which enhances the whitening effect. Again, very useful during this time. But all of these products have a, a major role to play in the whitening. When we would use 5% was when for younger patients, medically compromised patients or patients with existing sensitivity. So if you don't already have it, do order the 5%. It is very useful to use for many different purposes, particularly for therapeutic aesthetics. Um, for this patient, she had a liver transplant at the age of three and her teeth went green. And so she needed to do whitening treatment. And here we whitened for the patient. It's a lot better, it's not perfect, but it's a huge lot better. She was age 12 for her to go um, to high school with a beautiful white smile. On these patients, there's 10%, and this is for hydrogen peroxide only. Now, the difference between hydrogen peroxide and carbamide peroxide is the release of oxygen. Hydrogen peroxide, all the oxygen is released within half an hour. There's no benefit of using it longer. So if you're using a day product such as Polar Day or Enlighten Evolution, or, um, those are all day products. The oxygen, the um, gel is placed inside the tray for maximum half an hour. If you're using a carbamide peroxide, it lasts all the way, it lasts for 10 hours, which is why I prefer it, because it continues to release oxygen slowly. So we will, I, I know we, we um, I just want to cover a few more things. I'm going to talk about power bleaching and non-vital bleaching very quickly, and then we can take some questions. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about power bleaching. So power bleaching, we can use up to 6% hydrogen peroxide at the moment. Um, and we would do that as a chair side procedure. There's different ways of doing it. And we would use it not as the main treatment, but as a motivator. Um, there is a new product, which is called Blank One. And Blank One uses 16% carbamide peroxide as a chair side treatment. So often we would do this after whitening, sorry, after hygiene, we would clean the teeth and we would place the blank one onto the teeth for 10 minutes at the end of a hygiene appointment. Again, a simple way of delivering this. And then the patients would whiten their teeth in the trays. So if we are using a low concentration, 6% hydrogen peroxide, I would advise that we still um, place the barrier over the gingiva to make sure that you're practicing safely. We can then use the 6% hydrogen peroxide and heat up the gel. Place the syringe in a cup of hot water just to speed up the dissociation of the product. We can do compressed bleaching where we take a bleaching, um, a piece of cling film and we wrap over the um, whitening gel when we're doing power whitening. Or we can use the patient brings their bleaching trays in um, and you can do this in hygiene. You clean the teeth first and then do the, put the whitening gel in the upper teeth, you clean the lower teeth first, next, and you place the whitening gel. So it's a cleaning and whitening power chair side uh, procedure. Again, it, we will do extended appointments because of the post COVID era. So here for this patient, um, we have made sure we had isolation nicely on the teeth. And here is the, um, the cling film where we place this over the teeth to compress the gel inside. Things that can happen is you can get post uh, power bleaching, gingival irritation, soft tissue irritation, and the patient can become sensitive. 
So we would, um, throughout the power whitening procedure, we would take, through, um, we would divide it into 10 minute sections, so do the whitening for 10 minutes, stop, apply a soother, such as um, our relief gel or ultra ease, and then we would carry on with the next 10 minute procedure. So now things that can happen are you can get ulceration of the gums. Nowadays, using 6%, it's highly unlikely that you'll get ulceration of the gums. But we can, the way that you can deal with it, you can take a wet cotton wool roll and you can rehydrate this chemical burn. Most of the time, we want to tell our patients to tell us if they're experiencing any sensitivity or tingling or burning during power whitening, you want them to tell you so that you can stop straight away and apply and soothe any chemical burn areas. So for the last part of the presentation today, I want to talk about single discolored tooth and non-vital tooth. We have actually published on this and um, it was public, it came out last year. So if you go onto my website, lindagreenwell.com and go to resources, you can download those. So the, um, let's look about also single tooth whitening and non-vital bleaching and the techniques. The techniques are called sealed L in technique, outside, inside, open, or outside, inside, closed. The sealed in technique where you seal in the gel and that's the main treatment. Nowadays, we enhance the non-vital bleaching by making a segmental bleaching tray. So I prefer outside, inside, closed where we make a bleaching tray for a patient. And the product that, we use, that I prefer is 16% carbamide peroxide. These are the choices. You can use 10% carbamide, 16% carbamide, or 6% hydrogen peroxide. What we don't use anymore is we don't use 35% hydrogen peroxide in combination with sodium perborate because sodium perborate has been shown to have fetotoxic and cytotoxic effects. So, um, and, and there's a European legislation that we cannot use that. So if you look at these three cases, each one is slightly different. There's single tooth whitening. This tooth is a vital tooth. There was trauma, there was bleeding, and there's iron products inside, which is why there's a yellow discoloration. This tooth post-ortho developed an endo problem and was root treated, and this one was a trauma problem. Both had root canal treatments. So this is the vital tooth. On the vital tooth over here, we see, if you look on the radiograph, the pulp chamber is completely obliterated and the pulp canal is obliterated. So the way that we would do the whitening because of this, it's going to take longer to get the whitening gel through this tooth where there's secondary and tertiary dentine. So we would make, you can see the result from here to here. When we do this treatment, it's not just whitening one tooth. We whiten the dark tooth first, then we whiten the upper and the lower teeth. So you've got much more predictable whitening. And the way that we do this, we make a bleaching tray where we cut the teeth on either side and we bleach only the dark tooth first like this tooth here. This tooth was traumatized. We made a bleaching tray. This is the normal bleaching tray, which is scalloped. So the patient actually, we make the patient two bleaching trays. And here is the segmental bleaching tray for the dark tooth first. Always lighten the dark tooth first. If you were to place the normal bleaching tray, the teeth on either side would get lighter quicker and the result wouldn't look as good. So here is the patient's radiograph. You can see again, the pulp canal is, is um, closed. It's much smaller. Here are the bleaching trays. Here's the segmental. These are the difference between the two trays. And here, I would normally cut this myself. When I was in front of the patient, I would cut these and prepare that. And here's the final result for this patient. This patient tops up every three years. They top up the whitening gel. This is a diagrammatic explanation. It's called calcific metamorphosis, the vital teeth that have been traumatized in some way. So when the trauma hits, the pulp chamber starts to close and obliterate. And because of the secondary and tertiary dentine, whitening is going to take longer for these patients with calcific metamorphosis. The whitening of just that single tooth can take up to six weeks. So you prepare for it, explain that to the patients, and you make your recall appointments accordingly. Now let's look at how we are going to, in future, how are we going to um, manage our patients? What is involved? These are the questions um, that we need to go through. We need to look at the history. Did the patient have infection or was there trauma? Is, does the patient have existing pain because the patient should have no pain if we are doing non-vital bleaching? There should be no tapping pain, pressure or palpation pain. Um, and we need to look at the status of the endo. 
you need to take a radiograph and look, is there a lesion, a periapical lesion? Is there no lesion? What is the quality of the endo? Is the GP well condensed or is it sparse? We look at the clinical crown. How, um, what is the crown root ratio? How many restorations are there? And is there enough enamel to bleach? All of these are questions that we need to uh, decide. Then in terms of what is involved, consultation, x-rays, intraoral, diagnosis, treatment plan, and then we may want to redo the root canal. That may take us two, three hours, but these, these appointments are separate. Consultation, x-rays and diagnosis and treatment planning with consent is our separate appointments to the actual re-root canal treatment. We need to wait a month for, uh, to settle, then we, would take the bleach, then we would take impressions for bleaching trays. We would prepare a barrier, first stage whitening, second stage whitening, change of dressing, plus the using the bleaching tray, third stage dressing final. So the question is, how long does this take? And um, most dentists go, um, yeah, about two hours. But actually, when you look at it, it's actually about six hours of clinical time. So the fee needs to be related to your six hours of clinical time. Plus, if you have six appointments, your six hours plus your six um, extra PPE sessions to add to the cost. And that's how we need to work out what is involved. And here is the patient that we took through the journey where we went from here, first whitening the dark tooth, then we whitened everything. And um, here is a diagrammatic discussion because you need to have a barrier and the barrier needs to be two millimeters over the, um, two millimeters below the CEJ. Here's the CEJ needs to be two millimeters below. Because if you don't, when, you, when the patient smiles, you can see a gray band at the cervical area. So you need to have your barrier below. You do need to have a barrier over the gutta percha to prevent any of, um, any of the gel penetrating through the hydrogen of the um, gutta percha. So we prepare a barrier and then we would make the, put the bleaching gel inside and make a bleaching tray. Um, so these are the different steps, the treatment planning, consulting. Um, again, co um, consent is very important and we need to discuss risks and benefits of the treatment with the patient's choices that the patient has before they sign consent and um, they do consent to treatment. A lot of this now um, will probably be managed with video consultations. And the same with medical histories, and we've just downloaded for software of excellence a portal where the patient you don't have to print out paper anymore, patient answers online, and that goes straight into your um, clinical notes on the computer. No more touching of paper, no more um, ha handling cash. <laughs> and also, um, we would ask our patients nowadays to prepay in advance to do electronic transfers prior to seeing the patient. So it should make dentistry a little bit easier from the management side of point of view. So we would have done consent with the patient, gone through financial arrangements, and then we can start treatment. So let's just look at this endo. And who would say, okay, mm, it's okay. Or who would say, no, I think there's a, something here and I think there's something there. I think this endo needs to be redone. So we decided to redo it. Here's our paper that we published on safety issues of tooth whitening. So it's from the BDJ. Please have a look at that article. And when we redid it, there was an, when they took an X-ray in a different, air, a different angle, you can see the um, periapical lesion. Here is the root canal finished afterwards. This is from Dr. Jude Ferreira, who's the endodontist who worked with, with, uh, work with us in our specialist group practice. And here he's prepared a good barrier with sufficient material for placing the whitening gel. So let's just look at the barrier placement, how you do it. You measure the length of the clinical crown, which is about 10 millimeters, and then you would go two millimeters below the CEJ, and you know that it needs to be at least two millimeters in thickness. So it's like prepping 14 millimeters when you're preparing your barrier, almost like you're preparing a post on the tooth. So you would prep and place the barrier. The barrier was normally uh, resin modified glass or onoma. Then once you prepared it, you make a, blob, a bobsleigh designed to follow the dentine or tubules. And you would put 16% carbamide peroxide and you seal it in. We take the Teflon tape and then we plug it down and then we would place the um, gutter, we would place the glass or onoma over that. Check the occlusion, bring the patient back two weeks later. Um, here in this example of that, and here is the barrier nicely placed. 
what we would do is we change the syringe tip because it's difficult to get into the access cavity a thick syringe like this. So we change a tip to like an edge tip so we can backfill the uh, calmide peroxide into the access cavity. We bend the tip a little bit, backfill it, then we take the PTFE which is all prepared and we push it down, we plug it down and then so that's like a mesh and then we can place the resin modified glass or onoma. The patient would come back normally every two weeks and we would place fresh 16% carmide peroxide and the patient would bleach with 16% carmide peroxide on the dark tooth. And um, they continue to bleach with a ble the segmental bleaching tray every night. And we review the patient after two weeks. So the question is, what is your final restoration when you've completed uh, non-vital bleaching? Who would do a, a glass or onoma and who would do a composite? Now, it's important to remember that immediately after whitening, there is a lot of oxygen inside the tooth and your enamel bond strength is reduced by 20%. So it's no benefit to place a composite restoration immediately after doing non-vital bleaching as the access cavity restoration. You would rather want to do a glass or onoma or a resin modified glass or onoma. I would normally use a light shade. There's a B1 or a bleach shade resin modified glass or onoma as my final restoration in the access cavity. And that is all. He has a study looking at the strength of resin modified um, with whitening. So have a look at that. So I know there'll be a little bit over time, but I wanted to give you a brief overview today. There's still a whole lot more things that we can talk about. Um, we do offer um, advanced intensive programs for two days in the practice. Our next training day is the 9th and 10th of November. Um, uh, at the practice, we have dentists coming from all over the world. This one is um, Dr. Kulovitz from Russia and uh, my friend from Brazil to come and train with us. I'm happy to take some questions now. We did go through this very quickly, but I wanted to give you a, a brief overview so that you didn't fall asleep. So I'm going to stop sharing now, and um, I'm happy to take some questions. Linda, first of all, thank you very much for such a comprehensive, detailed, and more importantly, a really relevant presentation today. So really, really appreciate that on behalf of all the people who have joined the webinar today. Um, we've got so many questions. <laughs> five questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So let's run through a couple of them, okay? okay? We'll do that. If we don't manage to answer all the questions, just message me on Instagram and I'll try and answer the rest of the questions. But I'm happy to. Let's have a discussion now and let's and ask some questions. Sure. So, okay. Um, what type of whitening would help with heavy tetracycline stained teeth? So we would always start with 10% carbamide peroxide. And then if the patient wasn't sensitive and was managing it, then we go on to 16% carbamide. And we stick with the carbamide because of the slow release oxygen and then continue to whiten all the way through the night. So carbamide is a better product, especially for tetracycline stain because you've got to go deep inside into the dentine. When you're treating tetracycline patients, tell them not to go in the sunshine uh, because the tetracycline makes the teeth more yellow when they go in the sun. So no sunbathing while they're whitening. Okay. And, and will um, tetracycline staining only occur when the teeth are forming or will there be an impact when the, when the teeth are fully formed? Really good question. Who was that from Resh Reshma? That oh, no. was okay. from Kinari. Okay. So basically, we thought that tetracycline was being incorporated into the enamel as the tooth was forming. And this was early reports in the 60s. But now we know that at adult teeth, the tetracycline molecule can be incorporated inside. In fact, all antibiotics given at different ages can, um, it can incorporate inside. Specifically for, for teenagers, because teenagers are on long-term tetracycline medication for acne. And we now know, especially minocycline, minocycline causes quite a deep gray um, discoloration. So at any age, it's relevant. And because tetracycline is given for a two-year period, it is relevant and we need to discuss with a dermatologist redu um, um, helping to reduce that. Okay, thank you. Um, for whitening aligners mid-treatment, will composite attachments affect the outcome if they're still left in place? 
No. So um, if you are normally, if we're doing Invisalign treatment, as soon as the patient wants to do Invisalign or any aligner, then they want to whiten at the same time. So we would say, wait for a month until everything was settled down and there wasn't any sensitivity from the um, pressure of the liner. And then you can actually get starting to whiten. Now, just because they've got those little composite buttons on the tooth, it doesn't mean that when you finish whitening, when you take off the, um, those little buttons, you're gonna get a yellow spot underneath. It's absolutely fine to whiten because the whitening goes under through the enamel, through the dentine, and you get a good result. That's the same thing as if you want to whiten veneers. If you've, if you've done veneers, let's say 10, 15 years ago, and they're not looking great, and there's some black edges around the uh, labial surfaces, you can make a bleaching tray and do whitening behind the veneers to improve the appearance and to take away those black lines. So that is still relevant to do. And, and what sort of time period would you use that for, for, for veneers? Um, that actually takes time because mm -hmm. you've got the whole uh, labial surface on the veneer, um, it would take like six weeks, but you will get, number one, you'll get improvement of gingival health. Number two, you'll get that black leaking away. And number three, you'll get whitening underneath. So it's a nice um, option for patients when you don't want to um, change veneers, especially now patients may have been thinking about changing veneers. And because of the uh, global financial crisis now, they will be reducing their treatments, the extensive treatments, but whitening is such a simple thing to do. I'm hoping that all of you guys will do more whitening. And even while you're in triage phase, those patients that you know of record and they're regular tenders and they see the hygienist, you can supply them with whitening gel now and send those out and bill them because we need a little bit of income while our practices are closed. Sure. Okay, that's good. Um, when you say, um, I think it's four to six weeks whitening, can you explain that more, please? Is that two weeks um, upper, two weeks lower, two weeks upper and lower? Yeah. So basically, we always start with the upper. The upper whitening goes quickest and um, it's less sensitive. And we want to basically get an idea of how they're going to whiten because everybody whitens at a different rate. So we would do just the upper review them after two weeks, bring them back and see where you are on the shade guide. After you've done that, then you can determine when the next appointment will be. So what happens after two weeks normally, the tooth have gone from an A4 shade to about an A2. So you know that you then need to continue whitening on the upper. So we would say continue whitening for another week on just the upper, then they would introduce upper and lower tray for a week. Then you stop the upper and you do the lower but the lower takes about three weeks to really get effective whitening, and that's every night. It is slower, and sometimes you see on a, a lower canine, the tip of the tooth is white, but the lower third, the lower two thirds are still yellow because it takes that amount of time. Okay. Um, can you please repeat the names of the desensitizing gels to be used during treatment? Okay, so just write it down, there's three. There's, there's quite a few, but the three main ones are number one from, from SDI, that's called Polar Soothe. And um, that one has potassium nitrate and fluoride inside. Number two, it's called Relief Gel, and that is from Philips. And they're all proprietary gels. Um, and the Relief Gel has got ACP, amorphous calcium phosphate, in as well as fluoride and potassium nitrate. And the third one is called Ultra Ease, and that's from Optidet. So every time we do whitening, every time we do whitening, we always give them a sample of Sensodyne or um, any of the other soothing toothpaste, and we give them the a syringe of proprietary gel for soothing. Because at the end of the day, it's the patient's problem, it's not our problem. Our problem is to diagnose. So we instruct the patient, we spend a long time on the bleaching stage one appointment where we have to fit the bleaching tray at the chair side. That's part of our legislation responsibility. It says first treatment cycle by the, by the dentist or at the clinical environment to, um, to administer the gel. And then you have to put the gel in the tray. Patient's got to wear it and fit it. So then what I would do is I place the gel in the tray, in the patient's mouth, and we go, for the, we'll go through the rest of the consent in forms and instructions. And then I show them the syringe of the soothing gel. And I explain, you use the soothing gel. 
either depending on their sensitivity that's why everybody's different so we give different options so use the soothing gel either before whitening half an hour before you start whitening you just use that or you use it at the after whitening you do that for half an hour or you can use it instead of whitening so the patient is super sensitive you can skip a night and you go whitening one night soothing gel the next night whitening soothing gel and that way they've got some self-management options at the moment to help them even now you can supply the soothing gel if they have sensitivity and you know those patients i'm not talking about a new a random new patient i'm talking about your patients of record we can be doing that treatment now okay thank you that's really detailed um do you fabricate your own trays linda um, yes, we do sometimes. It depends on how busy we are, but we have patients traveling from all over the UK and they've traveled three hours to get to us and they've got to come back again. So then we make the bleaching trays for them. You can do the scanning and digital, um, you know, the scanning models and make them digitally. Um, actually, it's working out more expensive with the digital uh, bleaching trays at the moment, but um, just making an impression when we pour up, we use a little bit of salt in the plaster, pour it up quickly. We have the blow down machines at work and we do do it. But it depends on how busy we are. We've trained the hygienists and the dental assistants to make bleaching trays. So everybody is allowed to do that. The dentist has to do the prescription. Um, the hygienist is allowed to fit the bleaching tray, but we have to, we have to be around on the premises to supervise. Okay, one final question. Um, could you just say a little bit about the design of these whitening trays, please? Sure. There's a question here about are there courses open for hygienists? We do have courses for hygienists. Just contact us. Um, we do special ones because hygienists should be running the entire whitening program for dentists. And it should be dentists diagnosing. Dentists are motivating the patients. Hygienists take the photos. Hygienists take the impressions. The dental nurses, if they've done the courses, just by the way, they can take impressions as well. So the whole team can be involved in wiping. Sorry, what was the question again? Uh, the question was, was comments on the dental tray design. Okay, so the tray design, there are many different types and every company will say, you have to use my design. But the research has shown that you need no spacer, no reservoir, you don't need that. You want a tightly fillip, fitting tray. You can have a straight line, buckly and lingually, and just have a straight bleaching tray, but I prefer to be scalloped. So that's my preference. And the research, um, many of the researchers use a scalloped buckly and lingually, or you can have lingual uh, straight. You must cut away the papilla, the labial papilla, palatal papilla, and you can scallop the buckle and have the labial uh, and the straight on the palate. But you can use the Invisalign retainers or any retainer if you've got an Essex retainer for whitening even if it doesn't fit on the gingiva at the last millimeter and it's off the gingiva, you can still get effective whitening in a tray like that. Okay, thank you. Um, one final thing, Linda, would you like to comment on your um, charity that you've been focusing on the last few um, days and weeks? Yes, thank you for asking. So um, I set up the Dental Wellness Trust nine years ago and what we are doing at the moment, we're doing, it's called hashtag COVID-19 dental challenge. And we're asking dentists to donate their samples of toothpaste and toothbrushes to their local elderly care facility. Please do that, take a photo of you outside donating and the hashtag and tag the charity, which is Dental Wellness Trust, um, Instagram, Facebook, etc. cetera. But um, we do a lot of work in South Africa. And at the moment with everybody in lockdown, there's actually no food. So at the moment, we are feeding 15,000 kids a day um, with our programs and we are receiving donations. Anybody who wants to donate, please look on Virgin Money. But we are cooking food for the children, the 15,000 children, there's no food. And we are making masks and the toothbrush mamas are making masks. Um, everybody, it's compulsory to wear masks. Um, I know there's a whole debate about should we be wearing masks here, but I think the um, suggestions are, if you, especially if you're going on the tube in rush hour, everybody needs to be So um, yes, so we are very busy um, making sure that those who are vulnerable, the elderly people in hospices and um, the homeless are receiving toothpaste and toothbrushes donations every week. Thank you, that's a really great initiative, Linda. Well done for sorting that, doing that. And also, thank you so much. We had so many positive comments about the lecture today. Um, 
you know, I've been in cosmetic dentistry for so many years and I've learned so much myself today. So amazing, amazing webinar. Uh, for those attending, thank you for attending. The code for the CPD today is Dentex 